Um, the next Republican to make a serious effort was Elizabeth Dole from North Carolina. Um, and she ran in 2000. She raised five million, but she couldn't, that was not nearly enough to keep going. Um, but she was a senator. And Carol Mosley Braun in 2004. <clears throat> so by the time we get to Hillary Clinton in 2008, can you see what a sea change has already occurred? There have been now several decades of pretty seriously prepared women running, um, growing numbers of people, and I think a whole generation maturing for whom this was not so scary. In fact, it was kind of, what's the big deal? Um, although, I would argue that um, it was, there was still this element of, that shows up in the press, treatment of her. But by, 19, by 2008, there also had been women leaders of many other countries. Golda Meir in Israel, Indira Gandhi in India, Margaret Thatcher in um, England, Great Britain. So that it wasn't so unthinkable anymore. Um, and Hillary could and did raise the money to make a viable campaign. I can give you the words of her song, but I cannot <laughs> sing it because I'm not Celine Dion. Um, but I do think I do think it's kind of fun to let me get that little arrow out here. Go away. Um, I think it's fun to look at these songs because they tell you something about the message people are carrying and what they think people need to hear. You know, so from Victoria Woodhull's in your face. To Margaret Chase Smith, it's okay, I'm still a girl, and girls can do this. <clears throat> to um, kind of you and I were meant to fly higher than the clouds will sail across the sky. It's kind of like, we're gonna do this breakthrough together. This is big, it's a huge change, it's okay. We're doing it together. <clears throat> so that's the song that was chosen um, by her campaigns, you and I were meant to fly. Um, and we'll sail across the sky. Now, it is true that the coverage of Hillary's campaign was full of sexism. Those old ideas showed up in, in many, many ways. Commentators criticized things about her that it would never have occurred to them to criticize about a male candidate. Her laugh, her ankles, her clothes, her clapping. Um, on CNN, MSNBC, and most major news outlets, there were commentators who likened her to a bitch, a she-devil, the character, main character in Fatal Attraction, everyone's first wife, and a scolding mother. You can find all of these images in the coverage. There were t-shirts on, on the internet that said bros before hoes. There were um, airport malls, and I saw this. I wouldn't, I, I, I'm not sure I could have believed it if I didn't see it with my own eyes. There was a Hillary Nutcracker, um, which was a Nutcracker doll made to look like her. Um, all of that adds up to me to saying this country is still really uneasy at the idea of a woman in that kind of position of power. But that didn't stop her, and I maintain she could have won. And there's several things to notice. One is she fits a pattern in American politics. A lot of the breakthroughs at every level have come um, first with widows, women whose husbands held a position of elective office. He dies and she gets elected because she's seen as filling his shoes. It makes it more okay that she can do that. 
Now this goes back to 1920s in Texas where Pa Ferguson couldn't run for governor again, so he put up Ma Ferguson and she got elected president, governor of Texas. Not because Texans were comfortable with having a woman governor, but because they knew she was a front for Pa. Really, it was a way of electing Pa. <laughs> but later, people like Mar Margaret Chase Smith got in that way and then had a chance to show that they could do it. And so that pattern, um, widows and wives of, is, is a pattern that goes through many levels, and particularly when you get to, to uh, Congress and governorships. And the fact that she had been a first lady, she'd had her own career, but she was associated with Bill and, and his fundraising apparatus was not irrelevant, um, does fit a pattern. Wives of men who've held the same office have often been the breakthrough people. Um, and her ability to raise money did owe something to the Clinton machine. But she had also, by 2008, broken through and showed on her own that she could do it and she built her own networks and so forth. So it's not at all a case of people vicariously voting for Bill by voting for Hillary. Whoever voted for Hillary wanted, wanted Hillary. Um, and then you have to ask, why did she lose? And some people would say it's that residual sexism I don't think that I don't think that's the main thing, um, but I think that's an open conversation we could all have. I do think people were uneasy with dynasties, that having had two Bushes and worrying about having two Clintons um, made a lot of people uneasy. Um, and Obama, because she was linked with a dynasty, potential dynasty, Obama was the more effective symbol of change. <coughs> at that point. Um, so that's at least one um, set of things. We could talk about the weaknesses of her campaign. People have analyzed that um, endlessly. But um, I think what's important for, for, the, for our purposes today is that she was, in fact, really viable, and she could have won. And that is a breakthrough, though she didn't end up being our president. And the proof of that breakthrough, I think, is Sarah Palin. <laughs> now, I'm coming, to, I'm coming to the end, and we may we may have a long conversation here. Um, but isn't it interesting that McCain felt to uh, for his president his presidential aspirations to be successful, he needed a woman. I mean, that's just really interesting that he thought that. Um, I think what's clear now is that people don't vote for women because they're women and for men because they're men anymore anyway. Um, because women didn't flock over to vote for Sarah Palin. That people vote, women like men vote based on a whole set of issues and concerns and commitments. And so that, that was, I think, a kind of pandering that won't happen again. Um, but it's interesting that he thought that, he, that he perceived the, the power of women voters um, as enough that he should try and make this effort to get them to come over. Um, but I also, at the time, found myself wondering, how do we explain why Sarah Palin isn't scary the way Hillary was scary? You know, you didn't see the, well, the idea of a woman in a powerful position, what, what is it that makes this not so scary? Um, some of it is she was running for vice president and not president. So you could say, well, it's not that powerful a position. In fact, it's kind of a non-position. Unless the president dies, then, of course, yeah. it's the president. Um, but it's a secondary role, so maybe not so scary. Um, there are a whole lot of other things that fit into her image, that she was extremely attractive. Men, voters, talked about her to reporters about how she was hot. Um, she was a mom. She had multiple kids. That kind of softened it up. I mean, Hillary made a big deal about being a mom and was clearly a very wonderful mom and has a wonderful 
daughter, but she only had one, and so maybe, I don't know. Um, I, I think the most important thing is that what, what Sarah Palin taught us is that ideology trumps gender now, and that's a change. That, you know, what people's ideas are is far more important than what gender they have when it comes to who you're going to vote for. And I think many people in the media suddenly got self-conscious about the media sexism. Because whenever they those issues popped up about Sarah Palin, which they <coughs> certainly did, her clothes, her hair, whatever, um, mostly admiring, not always criticizing, but but her um, her baby, her daughter, all these things, um, conservative commentators jumped all over the media about their sexism. And it's, I, there was a kind of, I think, a, a broadening of the awareness of these attitudes that are kind of taken, when they're not challenged, people think it's not a big deal. They aren't reflecting on it. When they get challenged, and so there was a whole other group of people who suddenly thought, this is our person. And they're talking like that about her? They can't do that. That's sexist. Well, good. Let's, let's even the field here and um, think about it regarding everybody. Since that election, obviously, Sarah Palin and Hillary Clinton have both emerged as very powerful figures. Hillary Clinton is sec as a Secretary of State, and Sarah Palin is a leader of the Tea Party. And um, that, I think, as a historian of women, I just find this fascinating. Um, and I don't have answers. I'm, one of the things I always say is, I do the past. I don't do the present and the future. <laughs> because people always ask me, what's going to happen next at the end of most of my talks? And it's really important that you understand, I don't claim to have um, a capacity to understand the future. But, oh, I need to, uh, there, we need to get Sarah Palin up there and see the whole family thing um, was made very, very important in the way she was presented. Um, I guess one other thing I would say is that um, women in strong public positions are no longer anomalies. Now, if you go to the Fortune 500, you'll find the percentage of women in the top leadership is still pretty small. but. We all have examples in our lives of women in strong leadership positions everywhere. So it's not as big of a deal as it once was. And I think charisma and ideology um, come in male and female packages just equally much. And um, so we're, we're gradually learning to deal with powerful women across the political spectrum. Um, in our public life. And finally, the, the last thing I would say is that in that election, in 2008, it was women who elected Barack Obama because there was a huge gender gap in the electorate. And um, there's no, no question that, that they, made, they made the difference. So um, I do think the glass ceiling is um, deeply